Awesome. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having us today. My name is Candace Lee. I work for LA Metro. And today we are honored to be receiving our award for lead goals for the Location 64 building, um, the maintenance of way facility for the Purple Line project. This building um, was created uh, in association with a number of partners, one of which you will be uh, also seeing very soon, Ignacio Roman, who is the resident engineer for this project. Um, a number of partners helped to make this project, Clark Construction, Metro, um, DOE, but we wanted to give you a virtual tour, uh, just showing you what the facility looked like, uh, how we came to uh, produce this project, and to really show you um, the effort put into this lead gold facility. So this first photo you see here, um, it's the artwork, the facade that's on the building. Um, it's called Getting There. And it is a piece of artwork that's comprised of over 30,000 acrylic chips. Um, and when it hit, the light hits it in certain ways, um, if you walk across the building, you can kind of see the buses and rail cars blurring in and out of one, each, one another um, because of the sun and the angles that you're viewing it. It's a very beautiful piece of artwork. Um, we wanted to make sure it fit the setting because it's in the arts district um, in historic Los Angeles. And this particular piece of art, I think does the arts district a lot of justice. So Ignacio Roman will kind of talk about um, the building, location 64, minutes away. Um, here's a schematic for some point of reference. Ignacio? Hello, my name is Ignacio Roman is stated, uh, along with an office engineer, some inspectors and a configuration manager. We were the team supporting the construction of this facility. As you kind of look at the site plan here, the building is outlined. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, but let's look at the site. That dark area that looks like uh, maybe a Y that's facing towards the north. That is actually a set of tracks that splits into two, goes into the building. That's the outline of the building there. And one goes into a maintenance pit that it's at um, where the workers work below the vehicles, the rail vehicles. And the other one is at grade where the workers can uh, easily climb on top of it and work alongside of it. To as you go up a little bit, you'll see kind of a shaded area that looks like it's curving, maybe part of a circle, quarter of a circle. Uh, that's an easement, and underneath there, there's a storm drain that belongs to the city of Los Angeles. It's uh, 90 inches in diameter. It's 100 years old, and um, there's a lot of coordination with the city to make sure that we protected it prior to allowing our vehicles, uh, which are quite heavy, to cross over it dark area that's close to that Y, that inverted Y. And that dark area is the permeable pavement area. And we'll talk about that later, give you more of an idea. As you go to the top uh, right area, you'll see that there's a little triangle there. That's where the tracks join another metro facility by the name of Division 20. And that's where the rail vehicles actually travel and they're maintained. Uh, this facility maintains non-revenue, non-revenue meaning that ridership does not get on and pay for a fare. So non-revenue vehicles are the fleet services for Metro that include regular passenger vehicles uh, for supervisors to move back and forth, as well as uh, utility workers that maintain the track work, the systems, the signals, the power, and you'll see some of those utility vehicles, trucks um, shortly. And then as you go to the bottom of the page, uh, that's the area as you enter. It's got a one way in, one way out, separated by a guard shack. This is a controlled facility and uh, we maintain or Metro maintains 24 hours, seven day uh, a week security. Also, uh, just below it, that would be the street Santa Fe, which uh, if you would take north a little over a mile, you'd get to the Metro headquarters, which is also Union Station. So this facility is accessible by walking or uh, 
uh, using one of those shared bikes as well. And then just south, if you go to the right, which you'll see later where it's empty, there's a uh, iconic 6th Street bridge being built and you'll kind of get an idea of what's going on there. Let me talk a little bit about the building now, even though it's shaded, you'll get an opportunity to see it. The uh, building is composed of three stories. We started um, below the surface by uh, placing some footings uh, that go to the perimeter of the building, as well as a couple in the center for some of the load bearing uh, columns. And then there's a uh, layer of methane gas collection that eventually pipes the gas up passively because it's lighter than uh, air. And it goes up through the walls through a series of pipes and eventually it comes out through the roof uh, for ventilation. Utilities are all buried there as well. Uh, the floors are composed, and, and not just the uh, ground slab, but also the floor separating the second and third, and then the roof as well. They're composed, composed of reinforced concrete slabs. The building you'll see later on as well is um, has a skeleton of welded steel and uh, cross bracing. And that's kind of interesting because it was, it was left exposed as a, kind of a reminder that this is more of an industrial facility even though when you look at the picture with the artwork, it's quite a modern, beautiful looking building. The um, outside is composed of two different types of panels and glazing as well. The lower level has prefabricated uh, reinforced concrete uh, panels that you'll see later on. And then as you move up the building to the second and third floor, you have an aluminum alloy panel that's insulated and weatherproof. There's also a ramp from the first floor and uh, if you look at the lower right hand column, there's kind of like a little void uh, of the building kind of in the middle as you look at the middle. And that's where the ramp is. And that'll take you from the first floor up to the third floor. And on the third floor, uh, there's almost a 100 vehicle parking lot on top there. So uh, kind of unique about that third floor. As you look at the first floor, it's actually split into three uh, major areas where you have a warehouse parts storage that you'll be able to look at soon. You have a, a maintenance and repair shop area that I've sort of talked about. And then you have um, utility rooms for electricity, for fire, um, uh, workshops, and, and so forth. The building does have two sets of running elevators, uh, a freight elevator as well as a passenger elevator. It's got three stairwells as well for emergency use as i mentioned before the uh second uh, i'm sorry the third floor is mostly a parking lot but along the south side uh, it has a series of buildings that serve for storage as well as lockers and shop areas and then um, on the second floor as you go down about half the building the southern half so that would be this building right now is facing north um, the half of the building is now uh, available as a second floor with offices, training rooms, conference rooms, break rooms, um, and uh, cubicle space for working in there. Some of the other things that I just kind of gently want to uh, give you hints of. Um, the building, as you look to the left, that's that's looking uh, to the north. As you look to the left, before the next property there's a gap there and in that gap there metro was able to install a bioswell um, on that side and then we also have as the in the entrance we have some bicycle racks and bicycle lo lockers and then um, that other triangle that sticks to the north of the building that uh, provided a complexity because that section of land was provided to the neighbor for parking. So we had to develop that first and pave it and stripe it and fence it separately, turn it over to the neighbor that's just to the left of us. Uh, they produce uh, jeans there, they're known by, as uh, Lucky Brand jeans. And then we were able to take a section of their property, which they use for parking, which is the area on top of the page where you see parking stalls. We took that area and uh, then we could begin um, our parking 
our, our parking demolition utilities so forth. So that was a complexity. Their complexity was if you look at the top of the page, you see some lines. Those are active tracks, Metro um, as well as Amtrak, um, Metrolink, and then a little bit even uh, to the top of that would be BNSF and UPRR, the local freight companies that operate trains there. So in order for us to work on top of the page for footings, utilities, we had a duck bank that connects to another Metro facility. We had to get track allocation and make sure that those tracks were not being used by trains. In addition uh, to that, the area is then bordered on the other side by the LA River. And that drain that I was talking about has an outfall to the LA River. So we had to be sensitive to that as well. And I think that's all I have to offer on this slide, Candice. All right, let's go to the next one. So, yeah, Ignacio, you want to talk to the partners we had on the, the team? Yes, thank you. So th this was a design build contract where the contractor showed up with their designer. Here is a picture of Clark Construction. They were the winning team. They did have a designer by the name of Gruen and Associates, uh, local here, local to Los Angeles. The Clark team uh, turned out, uh, you'll see a very good product. But unfortunately, we had turnover of three different PMs. The PM with the blue shirt at the top wearing a hard hat and sunglasses is Damien Delora. He was here the longest, thank God. And um, his team there includes their area officer in charge, a vice president for Clark. So a lot of attention. That was great. Uh, their safety manager, quality manager, uh, office staff and uh, superintendent, as well as project engineers who had zero project had a value of about seven million dollars, not a small project. And uh, it's, it's quite complex, as I mentioned earlier, we'll go over the the uh, maintenance fees and the warehousing. There's a lot of um, complicated mechanical equipment and sensitive to installation. Moving on to the next slide, you'll see that the team includes third parties like the city of Los Angeles on the Left hand side, there's a group photo of the uh, Los Angeles um, Bureau of Engineering, as well as Los Angeles Bureau of Construction, which they serve as uh, inspectors. And I think there's one person uh, from the Los Angeles Bureau of uh, Department of Transportation, excuse me. And we needed that for street closures to bring in uh, materials, exit materials, and then some. The utility work actually happened on that street, Santa Fe, some relocation of utilities. So we needed uh, to work with all our partners there. In the middle, you'll see a photo of our team. And I'm the gentleman there without a hard hat, uh, surrounded by two women, uh, which makes up our office engineer and our configuration manager. And off to the left, you'll see an inspector as well as a safety um, manager for the team. And finally, on the right, You'll see my my boss with the hard hat, Joe DeMello, who um, is the Westside Purple Line Section 1 uh, Senior Construction Manager, and he was available for support as well. The gentleman next to him, Remy Omotaya, was the Deputy Executive Director for the maintenance of Way Group that would actually take control of the facility and uh, co-share it with Metro's non-revenue group and Management Inventory Logistics Group. This slide kind of gives you another view of what that building uh, artwork facade looks like. Um, it is very beautiful. Um, obviously, you can see the sunlight kind of showing how the different um, pieces of, um, but how the different pieces show in the light uh, from a different perspective. Um, and now we will talk, or this is an actual video of the facility, which Ignacio will kind of talk you through the very fast video. Um, this is this place. So that's the main entrance of the building. There's the guard shack. You see how it's separated in and out. To the left and the right, you would see the bike racks and lockers. That's a picture of the ramp. There's some parking as well as some vegetation there. This is parking closer to the south, and then we're moving east the entrance to some of the bays there for uh, repair and maintenance of vehicles. 
This is the oh, well, this is the second floor now that I talked about earlier. You see conference rooms, you see kitchens and break rooms. This is walking down the hallway and looking at the walls and looking at the bulletin boards for uh, information as the workers come in. Keep in mind that workers come in here in three shifts. Um, so information quickly needs to be shared with them. See cubicle space where the workers come in, check in, grab whatever is necessary, and then eventually go out to the field and then they end their days here. That's facing the south where the ramp would be. More of the cubicles and some of the offices outside the perimeter, taking advantage of that light. You'll also see shared furniture like copiers. Uh, again, heavy on the information sharing because we have three different um, crews coming in for a day swing and then night shift. And that's coming out of that um, operation. So we have a operations area there. These are some of the uh, signal maps and uh, track maps that are you uh, could be dry race boards. They could be manipulated and made notes on. So yeah, you can see the tracks. Um, they can make notes as they need to. This is one of the storage rooms on the third floor. Um, it stores some of the hazardous waste or just waste and uh, materials as needed. Um, outside there, you can see the electric vehicle charger um, and some of the actual uh, canopies for the solar um, photovoltaic system that's up there. Second floor hallway again, uh, COVID-19 separation stickers. As we're moving away from those operation offices, you see some of the training rooms on the outside. Um, making sure we have a safe distance there. And those rooms also serve as temporary offices for some of the other workers who are transitional. And then that would take you back to engineering. This is moving west. Towards the art work that you saw earlier, but notice how that wall with the steel bracing I mentioned earlier to make it industrial is exposed. And that is the limit to the second floor. After that, it's an open uh, first floor with 29 foot ceilings and that's because some of the rack the storage rack is maximized with such a high uh, ceiling you can see there and then you have to have a separation due to the fire code there those are rapid stacks and we'll, we'll kind of talk about them later you get a better opportunity to view them but notice the capacity that was asked for was granted and now we're coming out towards the elevator lobby area and stairwells and uh, the video will take you up to the third floor where Candace will share some more information. Yeah, so um, like Ignacio mentions, uh, we are taking COVID-19 very seriously. So there are those um, six feet separation stickers on the floor. Um, and as I left one of the rooms, um, you saw the, or went into one of the rooms, you saw that the light turned on automatically. So we have automatic dimmers and lights for all of the rooms. Um, lighting is very important, obviously, to reduce our overall energy where we can. Um, and as I go out to the third floor parking lot, um, you'll see some of the hazardous waste cabinets on the right side. Um, and again, showing the electric vehicle charger um, for reference. And yeah, that's some of the main features of the building. I didn't really get into the um, actual maintenance bay uh, but here is actually another showing of the photovoltaic system i'm going to talk a little bit at, about the actual construction of this building um, it's an historic arts district so as i mentioned we needed a site that was close to the current division 20 site which houses most of our trains um, and vehicles and track obviously we needed a building that uh, was large enough to house the kind of maintenance operations that we needed and um, it needed to be downtown. So lots of very specific needs here. Um, so we ended up having to purchase a former brownfield site to make what we needed to happen get done. Um, in buying that brownfield site, we had to do a very extensive remediation process, which took about a year um, for the soil remediation uh, practices 
and we're still working through groundwater remediation practices uh, till this day. Um, you can kind of see in this this uh, video, or not video, this picture, um, they're removing the current concrete once they were demolishing the um, building that was once there. Here you see an actual photo of that soil being, or the contaminated soil being taken away off of our trucks. Um, when we could, uh, we wanted to make sure that, that, well, one, the hazardous soils um, that were being taken away were taken to the right facility. Um, and for the soils that did come up, come in and replace that soil, we were able to reuse uh, soils from a current project we're also working on, regional connector. So we were able to introduce some reuse opportunities by using their current soils um, so we didn't have to purchase from an off-site project. And we had that concurrent um, uh, kind of connectivity between projects and project teams um, because they had soil to give away and we had soil we needed, which is nice. And here is some information on the construction waste diversion. For this project, we had a goal of 75%. We ended up meeting uh, the goal um, and exceeding it by about 2%. We had 77%. Um, percent diverted waste, about 606 tons total um, that we were able to divert from landfills, decrease our, our total impacts to landfill uh, waste um, and just landfill problem that exists in um, LA County, LA City specifically. And one other aspect I think is very important, the uh, sweepy dust mitigation for the site was very extensive. We had to make sure because before the site was obviously cleaned up uh, that we didn't let any of the soils accidentally get off site. So we had an extensive dust mitigation program. Um, the water truck would go across the site every couple of days uh, just to make sure that nothing was leaving the site um, and that we were making sure that we were protecting our neighbors from any of the contaminated dust that was on site during the con early construction process. So now Ignacio will talk a little bit more about the building um, and some of the aspects of it, Ignacio. So this is the south facade of the building. You're looking north. You can see the ramp. And if you follow the ramp as it goes from concrete to the steel, You'll see again some of that steel cross bracing, and then eventually you see the second and third floor. The building here, after the steel was installed, and this is the pretty much the facade where the pictures were taken for the topping off uh, celebration. What you see here is you'll see that the first floor is um, lined with uh, prefabricated concrete panels that I mentioned earlier, and those were trucked in and then hung. Um, with the crane, and it was kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, the way they were designed, and each each panel had a unique location. Some of them have cutouts for doors, as you can see, if you look towards the left. Some of them are smaller. As you look at the ramp and they go up, they become larger, and then the exterior has a anti-graffiti coating as well as a grooved um, vertical line pattern to help with the vertical lines that you see on the second and third level panels that are composed of an insulated weatherproof aluminum, uh, aluminum alloy um, that are also hung and then framed with the glazing. Notice how you have a lot of windows that are double pane glass that are hung on the south side to capture as much of the sunlight as, as possible. And then notice how they're tinted in different colors, not just for um, uh, some color coordination, but also for allowing a uh, certain light to come in while minimizing the amount of UV B and UVA lighting. Also, you see that we have just to the left of the picture, a little kind of gray cabinet. That's one of the bike lockers that uh, was mentioned earlier. There's also bike racks next to that tree. It's kind of hard to tell, but it would be just to the left of that. There's also parking that you see along um, the ramp, and they would be opposite as well. We can go to the next slide. This is that. 
this is the first floor. This is the the uh, warehouse parts storage facility that we mentioned earlier. These are known as rapid stacks and they're digitally controlled as well as hydraulically uh, powered where that vertical bar that you see there with the bucket has the ability of a kind of a robotic arm to take things from say that pallet stack at the bottom that you see there covered in, in bisqueen plastic and move it and stack it up on top in the middle in any section you want. So it helps with not only keeping our workers safe, but it's actually more efficient. And then if you move to the next picture, not only do you see the, the stacks and the capacity and see how high they go up, but in them because of fire code, you'll see there's some red um, fire lines that run up and eventually they go in the middle of the racks and that's just in case we were to catch fire, um, they'd be able to extinguish that fire. Moving into the other section of the facility where we have the rail bays uh, for maintenance and repair, this is the one with the sunken pit so that workers can get underneath the carriage of the vehicles. Now these vehicles are not the passenger vehicles where you would pay a fare to ride. These are the vehicles that if that train breaks down acts as a tow truck. These are the vehicles that have rail, ve rail wheels that go out and adjust the rock we call ballast that adjust the rails because over time um, it settles and it moves. So we want to raise it back up and be able to maintain not only the rideability, the comfort of rideability, but also the drainage of it. Notice here that in order to facilitate the maintenance of them, we have a lot of lubrication and compressed air and antifreeze lines on both sides, and they're color coded to uh, identify what type of um, of uh, lubrication is in there, as well as waste drums and um, and access and egress and degress um, for the pit. There are two uh, maintenance bay for railed vehicles. That's one of them. And then the remaining nine out of 11 are for rubber tire vehicles that include general fleet cars that you saw earlier parked by the ramp, as well as many utility vehicles. And here you see some of the trucks from uh, ones that are um, to carry materials, others that are already stacked with uh, tools and equipment, and finally some that have a boom. Notice that it's quite complicated in here. If you look far to the right on the top, you'll see like a yellow bar. That's a crane. And in that crane, we could pick up heavier loads. Uh, hence, you see that, uh, that truck with the boom. We also have floor jacks that are called vertical lifts and they're inserted in the ground and then uh, as needed, they will raise the vehicle up or not. We also have exhaust fans for carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. We also have more hose reels for the lubrication as well as the uh, compressed air, etc. We have computer diagnostic machines in there as well, and um, probably many more things I'm forgetting, but that kind of gives you an idea what the maintenance bays are for. Uh, so now we'll talk a little bit about what that solar uh, rooftop looks like. So this is a schematic of the solar rooftop, rooftop design. Um, there are four canopies currently, some which serve as just general canopy for the building, others would serve as canopy for the parking spaces. So uh, this is a better photo of what it looks like on the site. Um, there is, it's a 313.6 kilowatt DC power. Uh, photovoltaic system um, store or system output ranges, but we believe that there's about 509,000 kilowatt hours per year that is gained um, from this photovoltaic system. Um, it acts as both the canopy for the car, so it keeps those cars cool on a regular basis, and it keeps the overall um, albedo of the site pretty high. We have very uh, we keep our heat island impact very low because the one this the roof is uh, white. As you can see, it's a little bit light colored uh, concrete. And we also have this cover on top of it to make sure that um, we are keeping the building cooler overall. 
And here's another photo of that photovoltaic system, as well as the light colored pavement on top of that building. So it's bouncing and reflecting off the solar radiation. Um, you can also, again, see a better photo or better look at this rail um, system that um, integrates with the current Division 20 tax site. So it takes on those non revenue vehicles into here. Um, and here are some other photos of some of the storage systems there. Ignacio, anything else here? Yeah, that other curved area that's light, it's also concrete, has a blue waste bin and then a yellow truck. That's the um, drainage structure that I mentioned earlier. That's 100 years old, so we had to protect that. You'll also see north of it or top of it, you'll see the white uh, independent hazardous waste storage facility there with alarm and um, uh, controlled access as well. Then as you move to the right, you see some more blue waste bins and those are permanent. The, the facility uh, separates waste. And then you can't see this, but if you were to look at the separation in between that other neighbor, which is Lucky Brand Jeans and our facility, you would see the bioswell. So it's kind of just north of that building. And then as you move over to the right, you'll see the street Santa Fe where we had to do sewer, um, storm drain, uh, electrical power and communications uh, relocations. Not only is it convenient to have, but we had to widen the street there for the city. You can kind of see a concrete truck on the outside of it. We had to widen the street for them as well. And because the arts district has a lot of public art and a lot of creative individuals that are there, uh, there's constant uh, filming out there. So there's a lot of coordination with them for us to have access or not, uh, to give access to them, closing of streets so that we had to direct our, our deliveries to take different routes, a lot of coordination there. And then if you go a little bit more to the north and you see a bunch of white cars parked, it looks like the dirt area, that's the head office for the city of LA um, reconstruction of the iconic Sixth Street Bridge, which is quite beautiful if you get a chance. But there was a lot of coordination and many times we would just walk over into their offices or they would walk over to us. Now, finally, before we leave this picture, notice how the site is quite compact and it has a lot of neighbors all around it. Um, as we were building it, we quickly realized that the workers would not be able to park on site. So one of the things that we did is we said, if you're going to park on site, um, when the time comes, you're going to have to find your own parking. So the contractor rented out a facility for parking of their workers and then had a bus that would bring them forth. And one of the things that they noticed that people didn't want to use the shuttle. So the workers started to commute and um, uh, carpool quite a bit. So it cut down on the number of vehicles. The other thing that, that happened was, was um, when we were on site and we had these creative um, solutions to problems, that continued throughout the entire construction process. So sometimes having limitations. That's all. Oh, lighting. So moving into lighting, this was a, a very, very unique opportunity for the contractor where they proposed wireless uh, lighting. Uh, not only did it save them some time and money, and as I mentioned earlier, the schedule was quite uh, tight, but it allowed us more uh, flexibility. Not only do the lights come with sensors where motion is detected to turn them on or off or sustain their, their lighting, but this uh, wireless white, uh, lighting was connected to the building management system and also had the capability or has the capability today to be programmed through a cell phone having the right authorization. So some of the things like the COVID-19 impacts that have changed the way we work initially from almost deserting the facility, the lighting control was reprogrammed offsite. And then as people have come back, certain areas have been given more light use and so forth without having to have the actual individual programming in the building light system. So a, a very good uh, a product that we received here. Here's one of the uh, conference rooms. I didn't really get to show a good photo or a bit good photo in the video. So here's another look at it. Lots of natural light coming in um, to the south of the building. You can see the historic the city 
Street Bridge, still going up to this day. Um, yeah, each conference room has a number of waste back baskets and recycling bins um, that people can access. This is also accessible at the, in the cubicle and office stations. Um, and now we'll talk a little bit about the permeable pavement and just LID components of the project. This particular project had a permeable pavement, um, a bioswell, and a dry well piece to the design. This is a schematic of what it looks like. Um, and this is what it looks like in action. Um, when we were pur purging the water lines at the time, um, we were able to get a good video of what it looks like. So the area is about right here. And I don't see the whole thing, but it falls into this area as well. Um, but as he's purging it, you can see that the water is automatically getting sucked into the porous um, pieces of the concrete and going directly down um, into the storage, which will eventually go to groundwater. Um, and if there's too much water, obviously it goes to storm drain as needed um, in the emergency, but you see all that water's going down um, to groundwater. And yeah, um, with all those different features, some things that I didn't include, but were in it were the bike racks, um, which are also south of the building um, and the, the security guard uh, gate. We have drought tolerant um, plants um, that are strewn throughout the site. Um, and those plants have a temporary uh, irrigation now, but that irrigation obviously won't be needed um, once those plants are established in those areas. So uh, even though it's non-potable water that's being used, which is also a point, um, we won't have to use that non-potable water after a while as much because those plants will be established and they won't need as much water in the future. And overall, with all of those different parts, we ended up with about 73 points, which led to us getting a LEED Gold certification for this building. And yeah, so we want to thank uh, USGBC again for uh, helping us through this process. We had a long but um, I think very useful process with our LEED Commission officer um, and our uh, commissioner that helped us to really put together the documentation, um, talk to all the things that we needed um, to make sure that our points were actually um, used and we actually got to, to get those points. Um, and yeah, it was a, a great opportunity for everyone involved. I also wanna thank some other people, Evan Rosenberg, who is one of the principal uh, sustainability office, uh, officers on this project. Um, along with my boss, Chris Laban, who is the head of our ECSD Environmental Compliance and Sustainability Department, um, and now the um, EO of Sustainability uh, Metro-wide. Um, they are a big part of what makes sustainability happen for Metro, and we want to continue to make projects like this as we continue on in the future. Um, last but not least, I'm going to show a brief video Oh, this is one more picture of the facade just as a ending. And I'm going to show one more video um, celebrating our, we are Envision Platinum um, certification that we received for the whole of Purple Line Section 1. Um, myself, along with uh, Michelle Marcus Riley, um, who were principal environmental specialists on the project, um, Jim Cohen, who is our project director um, and Joe DeMello, who's our construction manager for the project. Um, in partnership with STS, Skanska Trailer Shea, helped to prepare uh, the different pieces for the Envision Certified Platinum project. Our main cohort, cohort on STS's side was John Bello. So we worked together to put together the different parts of Envision and eventually got Envision certified platinum for this project, which we are very, very proud of. Um, 